So as part of Trexone.org's 10th birthday celebrations, firing up the satellite to Los Angeles, Rod Roddenberry is there for me. Rod, thanks so much for joining me. How are you, mate? I'm doing good, and congratulations to you. 10 years, that's, that's kind of a milestone. It is a very long milestone. I was in Perth uh, last weekend for a convention, chatting to Anthony Montgomery. I mentioned to him that it's uh, been going, or it started when I was in high school and being 26 now, that's, well, it's wow. almost as old as, as I am. Wow, congratulations. Yeah, I love Anthony. I'm glad he was there. I'm glad you got to meet him. Yeah, and his new series, Miles Away, looks really interesting. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So Rod, being the son of Gene Roddenberry, What's it, what was it like growing up? Um, you know, uh, I, I do get that question a lot, and it, and it constantly changes, at least from my perspective. Um, you know, as a young boy, I really didn't appreciate or know who Gene Roddenberry was in terms of, of Star Trek and fandom. I knew he did this TV show called Star Trek, but I never really watched it. I was into, like, uh, Dukes of Hazard and Knight Rider and Starsky and Hutch and those kinds of things. Um, but, you know, a as I got older, I, I began to understand a little bit about Star Trek, but it wasn't until he passed away that I really sort of opened my eyes and ears to what Star Trek was. You know, that it was far more than just entertainment. It, it, it touched lives. It inspired people. And I, I, I spent the, the following years, I, I'd say every year since then, sort of examining what it was about Star Trek and my father's philosophy that inspired so many people. And it's something that I've, I've really connected with and am trying to incorporate into my life. And it's something I genuinely want to continue on because I believe in that future. I'm, I'd say I, I would go beyond just a fan of Star Trek. I'm a fan of the philosophy and I do believe in the human potential. I have seen it. I think we've all seen it. So uh, not, not, not to go on too much about this, but um, now it is the best burden I could possibly have. And I only say burden because it's somewhat self-imposed any difficulties that come from it, but the benefits far outweigh anything negative. And uh, I I'm just extremely proud of it. What do you think makes fans love Star Trek so much and what makes it such an enduring franchise? Well, I, I really have to say it it's because Star Trek is more than just science fiction. Now, now I, I love Star Wars and I, and I have nothing negative to say about Star Wars, but Star Wars is, is a wonderful story and I don't know that there are that many life lessons except for, um, you know, do good. Uh, Star Trek, I think, has a lot of life lessons. It's very inspiring, and it really paints a picture of a future that I think we all want to live in. It, it's really been amazing that um, in, in this documentary that I did a number of years ago, uh, I actually, you know, talked to people from all around the world, people of different ethnicities, people of uh, different backgrounds, different economic statuses, different, different political beliefs, who all um, sort of believed in this future. They all sort of came together and said, despite what we believe now, we want to live in a future like that. And I love the way that Star Trek sort of can bring humanity together like that. Now, some may say it's just a TV show, and it is just a TV show, but, you know, Dare I say, there are some books out there that are only books, but we take special meanings from them and we incorporate them into our lives. And I do want to chat to you about uh, Trek Nation, your documentary, but very quickly, I wanted to ask you uh, your thoughts on how JJ is tackling Star Trek. You know, I, I've, I've got to say I'm a fan. Um, I, I'm one of the few who wants to give credit to JJ, Rick Berman, Brandon Braga, all of these people. They, they are all flawed. I'm flawed, Gene Roddenberry was flawed. None of them did it the way Gene Roddenberry would do it. However, none of them wanted to do it the way Gene Roddenberry to do it. They, they, they paid special attention to what had been established. I think to the best of their ability, they looked at the, uh, the canon, they looked at what Star Trek had established in terms of philosophy in the past, and they did the best they could. So um, in terms of what J.J. and his, his team did, uh, I give them tremendous credit for the movies. And I, I actually really liked the last one. I felt the last one had some humanistic themes. It was, the first one was setting up the characters. The second one is sort of setting up Starfleet. And um, even though there are some things that I feel are, are very raw, we are talking about the beginning of the Federation and Starfleet. So I'm able to, I don't even want to use the word forgive, but but understand why they, they 
made those choices, made the characters as raw and as fallible as they are. Being fallible is a very, uh, um, uh, I hate saying this, but Roddenberry theme, Star Trek theme. Um, my father never said that we are great now. He said, we have the potential to be great. We are learning, we are smart. We can one day be uh, that better society, that better species. I think that's what Star Trek's always always been about. It's always sort of represented the time in which it was made. Like the original series was very different to Next Gen and, and even Deep Space Nine took it the sort of next step further. Well, when it comes to the original series and Next Generation, they are very different shows. And I'm, I'm definitely a product of the Next Generation. I was, I was born and raised with the Next Generation. And, and currently, um, about a year ago, I started a podcast called The Mission Log. And, you know, my examination since my father died, as I said, was to really sort of look at Star Trek, look at him, look at the philosophy and see, you know, what was there, what did the fans bring to it, etc. And I've had the opportunity to go through and, and we're halfway through the second season and uh, I've been watching each episode with a critical eye and I've been noticing how different it is than the next generation and I can see how my father was different at that time and how obviously society was different at that time. My father was a, a much younger man. He definitely identified more with the Kirk character and of course Spock and McCoy, but with the Kirk character. He would, I'm not saying he's the first to throw a punch, but he was the first to go down to a planet and intervene in that planet to right the wrongs that he saw there. Um, in Next Generation, uh, I, I think my father's philosophy was more, de was more of the prime directive we are who we are today because of all the mistakes, faults, and follies in our history. And had we had the chance to go back and fix all of those, we would probably be far worse off than today. That's, that's at least the philosophy that he had, and, and I share that as well. So I think in the next generation, it was definitely one that, that we just went to a planet and didn't intervene and let them make the mistakes so they could learn. And, uh, you know, I, I wasn't that involved with, and I haven't really paid too much attention to Deep Space Nine, Voyager, and Enterprise, but um, this Mission Log podcast is going to be a 14-year-long project where we are going to look at every single episode uh, one week at a time in air order. So by our calculations, we'll be done in about 14 years. Wow. Well, that's a pretty long-term goal then. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. We have, we have two great hosts, Sean Champion and Ken Ray. Um, I, I'm not talented enough to be a host, but I definitely work uh, in the background with them. And uh, they, they are not only critical and they not only analyze it, but they do it with a lot of wit and humor. So I think people out there who are Star Trek fans or aren't Star Trek fans will find it uh, probably informative and entertaining. Now, speaking of long-term goals and ambitions, Trek Nation is a documentary you produced from uh, 2001 to 2010. Uh, what was the driving force yes. behind that? Well, you know, uh, Trek Nation had a number of evolutions. Uh, as you mentioned, we started back in 2001, and, and my initial idea back then was to do something, was to do the opposite of a documentary called Trekkies. Trekkies went out and sort of lambasted the fans and said, uh, look at all these crackpots in these costumes. Well, my experience with fandom to that point had been a majority of them were very down-to-earth, passionate people who believed in that future. And sure, they went to conventions and put on costumes, but that's just the same thing as uh, going to a, a, a football or, or sports game and painting your face or driving a Harley and wearing leather chaps. Um, they were just that passionate about it. And so I wanted to do a documentary that showed that. Uh, I met a producer by the name of Scott Calthorpe who really introduced the father-son angle. And at the time, I was somewhat resistant to that because it didn't make sense to me. But over the years, as it evolved, that became more and more of the backbone of the story. And of course, we had an amazing team. And I can't forget Trevor Roth, who actually, there were so many times that I wanted to throw up my arms because it's so hard to see the forest through the trees when you're doing something so personal. And uh, he really came in. And, and brought things back on track and got things going with uh, 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 Scott and I. And uh, it, it, it was an amazing journey. And you probably, you probably only see about 2 to 3% of it in the documentary. But in this new deluxe edition, which we've been waiting so long to get out there, um, we have awesome interviews with people like Seth MacFarlane, George Lucas, Stan Lee, uh, and of course, J.J. Abrams. Um, these are extensive, you know, 20 or 30 minute interviews with these guys that we weren't able to get in to the documentary. 
We also have some uh, uh, special uh, uh, featurettes in there that, again, we weren't able to get into the documentary because we only had 90 minutes. And we had about 200 hours of footage. So if you can imagine cutting 200 hours of footage into 90 minutes, it was gut-wrenching what we had to cut out. So we're really excited about this new DVD because it's going to bring a lot of content that people haven't seen yet. And that deluxe edition, the, the two-disc special edition, is out now. Yes, yes. It's out now. <laughs> you know, I actually haven't had a chance, Rod, to check out the original version of the documentary, so I'm going to make a very big effort to check out this special edition to see how your, your work is done. Well, yeah, and if, if, you know, not to go on about this, but I mean, it, it's a, I don't want to say unbiased look at, you know, I wanted to find the good and bad about Gene Roddenberry because there are all those stories out there. And on this journey, you know, I was able to do that. And I, you know, I found the man somewhere in the middle, which is perfect. I wanted to humanize him. And that's what I did. And I believe that's what this documentary does. There's a lot of pieces out there on Star Trek and Gene Roddenberry, and I call them somewhat fluff pieces because they just talk about his genius and how great he was. And he was a genius and he was great, but it was important for me to show the human side of him. And uh, I, I think in this documentary, whether you're a Star Trek fan or not, I think the father-son or father-daughter connection uh, is hopefully uh, bridged when you watch it. Rod, is there anything else you wanted to cover? Well, we, you know, at Roddenberry Entertainment, we have a number of projects. Um, you know, we've been really interested in the new media realm or even uh, arguably the old media realm. I, I've, I've myself have never been cut out for traditional Hollywood or television or, or movies like that, but uh, we've really been interested in, in comic books and graphic novels. And we have one that's been tremendously uh, successful called Days Missing, which uh, is doing the third series. We're launching that sometime near the end of this year. But the two graphic novels, uh, first two graphic novels are out right now. Um, and we've got a brand new one called Worth, which is, is really, really interesting. It's sort of about a, what, the main idea is what happens when a superhero um, sort of, I don't want to say loses his power, but is, is sort of, uh, no longer needed by society. It's the superpowers, uh, the superheroes fall from, from fame. And um, it, it, it really deals with the human side of it. And that's what we try to do at Roddenberry, is we try to always look at the human side of all of these characters, even if they are not human themselves. Cannot wait to hear more about all of that. Rod, thank you so much for joining me. I really appreciate it. Absolutely, thank you so much for having me here.